So I want to start, I want to know the story about how you end up playing at the Masters. <laughs> a went, week or two before the Masters, or month, or two months, I mean. So my, my one of my very best friends in the world I went to college with married a girl whose father was a member. And they got married 25 years ago. And when they got married, I said, damn, you, you know, he's a, he's a member of Augusta National. He said, yeah, I know, I know. And I said, well, I, I, I'd like, I'd like, I'd like to be first on the list, you know, when you, when you, when you get an invite, I'd like to be you know, first on the list. He says, you can bring a buddy. You want to yeah, be, I want to be the guy. Right. I, I mean, I look and, and if somebody if he takes you and somebody gets sick or they get a car wreck, I, I could be there in two hours. Car, my clubs are always in the car. And, uh, took 25 years to get the phone call. No kidding. 25 years. So he's played yeah. a bunch since yeah. then, right? He's you played, just, He's played so many times he turns it down now when he gets when his father in law calls him and says he wanna play. He's like well, you know, he's working, he's working, you know, he can't do it. He's probably been there hundreds of times. So I, I hear that the thing is if you're a member that when you go that that the expensive part is not really the golf. The expensive part is your buddy you bring, he wants to get a shirt and he wants to get a something to eat and he wants to stay in the butler cabin and all that stuff's what I really I adds spent seven hundred dollars in the golf shop. I didn't even know what I was buying. I just literally started grabbing stuff. And uh, and and my host turned to me at one point and said, you know, you need to leave stuff for somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> Which is pretty funny. So I you know, I grabbed like four shirts and 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 a belt. I'm probably wearing this belt right now. And uh, you know, keychain stuff. I got when I got home, I was like, why did I buy a keychain? I, I don't know. But um, going in that Augusta National Golf Shop is like a kid in a candy store. I mean, you walk in there. Is it like, different than what's in yeah. the, for the regular patrons? Yeah. yeah. There's wow. some, so they have some of the master stuff in there, but then they have like all, all a, the majority of it has a different logo. And and so that's part of the magic is you're like, yeah. I can get that anyhow. I'm, yeah. I'm taking that. Yeah. Um, but you'll notice uh, uh, an Augusta logo has uh, the United the flag. States and the flag, and it says masters below it if it's from the tournament. If it's not from the tournament, there's doesn't say Masters below. Oh, that's it's how just you know the logo. Difference. So if you got a logo and it doesn't say Masters, you got some. That is that is a collector's. So item. when I was a kid, my dad went to medical school in Augusta, and all my friends, you know, that were from Augusta for years, I've been able to go to the Masters. So I've been real fortunate. But when we were, when we were like twelve or thirteen, I remember my mom pulling up in front of of uh, the the masters in her station wagon and eight of us piling out because at practice rounds, it, it didn't yeah. cost anything. You yeah. could just go. Sure. And so we went yeah, back just, yeah. before yeah. it was cool, right? Yeah. And, yeah. And, um, and so uh, friends of mine from, from, from elementary school, their parents and them have given me badges over the years. So I've, I've been a lot and it's just a wonderful experience. It is, isn't it? It's, it's, it's incredible. You, you know, the interesting thing for me was I had built it up so much in my mind uh, I had 15 golf lessons before I played because I just wanted to go hit balls and, and it was winter time, it's cold. So right. I, I just wanted to go hit balls. So I kept taking lessons and I had built it up so much in my mind that I was certain I was going to be disappointed with the actual experience. And like the actual experience blew away my expectations. It was better it than was what you thought. Way better. I mean, just the whole experience there is, it's just different. You know, that's it's so just, cool. It's just different. Oh, so play. what did you shoot? I that's the play. big yeah, question. Yeah. I shot, uh, you know, depending on uh, how many uh, tap in, about an, about an 88 roughly. I and you would normally shoot what? 84, 85. So it's a little bit, a little, not quite as good. I as shanked normal. five balls on the front nine. Five. Front nine? Five. What was about so a nervous. big corner? Did you get a around? corner, it? I was fine. I was so <laughs> nervous when I stepped on that first tee box, my hands were shaking. I mean, did you show the balls that you five. that you used? Did you do that like like Gary Player son? Did you put yeah. your balls in? Yeah, nobody really cared. <laughs> yeah, um, but the the uh, yeah. So I birdied. Uh, or I'm sorry, I parred 12 and I parred 16, which to me that was huge. That's all I want to think about is then going to drink. Yeah, hitting those things on the green, and and it's amazing to watch the Masters how many how, how hard they make that shot. It's not that hard of a shot, but you know. Wind's blowing, and it's a tournament. I mean, it's, it's a different deal for them. It is. So, everybody, I've got Tom Green with me today. And, um, Tom, thank you for coming. Tom um, owns Alliance Benefits. And, um, and the how I, I, I just met Tom just now, basically. But the reason why Tom is here is because 
of my two sons. Both of them kept telling me, Dad, you got to have Tom Green. You got to have Tom Green. He's an awesome guy. And what I have found out is that Tom has been a mentor to my two sons, and he's been kind of really helpful to me as a father. And so I thought it was cool that my sons think he's cool. And so I know he's very successful. He's in a lot of different businesses. We'll get into all that. But I wanted y'all to uh, meet Tom Green and, and hear a little bit about how he goes about his business, how he markets it, and, and what his attitudes and stuff are. And um, and how he thinks about business. So, Tom, thank you for coming. Thank you for having and, me. And we normally kind of start off with a bourbon. So this is kind of really cool. This is a first. So Tom has brought this uh, running iron straight whiskey. A lot of people don't know this, but in order for whiskey to be called straight whiskey, it has to be a minimum of two years old. This particular whiskey, Tom is telling me, is out of Montana and that it's all wheat. Now, a lot of people don't know this time, but in the early days of whiskey, what happened is you used whatever grain was in the field. So if you go to Scotland, you got malted barley. In the south, we got corn. Out in the west, you've got wheat and rye. So most of those whiskeys were made from that grain. And so that's how we came up with rye and wheat and malted barley and corn whiskey. So so this is a weeded whiskey, wheat that comes out of the field in Montana. I did a that's little great. research on it. So tell me what tell me what you know about about this whiskey. So this is the uh, only whiskey that is distilled in the state of Montana. So you so if you want to try some other Montana whiskeys, you can. This is the only one you're going to get. They're distilled somewhere else. They're distilled somewhere else. So this is a, a friend of mine, uh, Mark Lewis, who owns a liquor store in uh, Bozeman, Montana, who came across a family who had uh, a family member who passed away. And they, he had laid all this whiskey in barrels and it had been sitting in this barn and they needed to get rid of it. So he went in and said, well, you know. I'll would, take it. You, yeah, I'll tell you, what do you, <laughs> what do you want for it? And so they cut a deal and he bought the whiskey and created the, the brand. And, and he started just putting it in the bottles. In bottles and, and, it's, and it's mostly sold to people who go to Bozeman to fish, guys like us, that go into the liquor store and say, what do you have that's local? And this is it. And that's it. That's all there is. So, And it's only in Montana? It's only in Montana right now. So if I yeah. wanted to bottle this, can I get a bottle of this? Can, can I call them? Or? You can break into my basement. And get the bottle. <laughs> or you can call Montana Wine and Spirits in yeah. Bozeman, Montana, and they'll ship you a case of it. So are you an investor in I, it? I am, yeah. So how yeah. does that yeah. work as an yeah. investor in a in a liquor business? Well, um, so originally... Well, you don't have to give me all the details. But. Well, originally when Mark started the business, uh, my brother-in-law... I uh, loaned him some money to help get the business help going. going. And then uh, and that was the first business. And then he came across the Did barrel Did he pay you whiskey. back in barrels? He's been paying us back. <laughs> he's been paying us back a nice dividend. And and then he found the barrels of whiskey and called us and said, I got another deal for you. I got this whiskey. And I want to buy this whiskey and create a brand called Running Iron. And so we, we kind of talked a little bit. And one of the things that sold me is if you look through this bottle, you can look through the state of Montana. Right here? Yeah, and you can see in the back, there's brands. See the brands all on the oh, label on the inside? that's cool. And I don't know if y'all can see that, but it's like branding iron on a, on a cow. And those brands are either Montana brands or our initials. So there's a TG in there somewhere. If you have to finish drinking the liquor, and then you can't see the brands anymore. But ideally, you have to finish the liquor to see the brands. But either way, it's in there somewhere. That's awesome. And then, yeah, isn't that cool? And then he he brought this exceptional bottle that you really can't buy. So tell us tell us about this mason jar liquor here. So this is uh, I, I should probably have like a pixelated thing over my face as I <laughs> as I explain this. This is bootleg whiskey. Uh, this is made by a friend of mine who's a, a physician. We'll just call him Hunter. And Hunter's been making whiskey for about 15 years in his garage. And he started out just kind of throwing stuff together. And the guy's got really good at making whiskey. It's very good. So when he brought me this, I, you know, I, I thought it was moonshine. And I thought, I don't really like moonshine. And he said, no, yeah, yeah, yeah t -t taste it. So I took the top off of it, took a little smell of it. I was like, that's a real, it's a very, very good And whiskey. what is, what's, is it a rye it's base? It's a wheat, it's a wheat, wheat whiskey. And uh, it is, uh, it is uh, put in very, very small barrels, uh, which, it, it, accelerates the aging process. Yeah. So it's the equivalent of a 15 year aged whiskey and it's incredibly smooth. 
So you take a 55 gallon barrel, you know, that's what they normally use. And then if you put it in a two or five gallon yep. barrel, yep. you can double, triple, quadruple yep. the amount of time because it interacts with the, you know, with the wood. And, um, and all whiskeys, for those of you that don't know, have to be, American whiskey has to be in a, an oak barrel, a new oak barrel that's been charred. So it has to be charred on the inside. So that kind of gives it that. But you can see how dark colored this is. Like and most of your older whiskeys are darker colored. So this is really good. This is really good. Um, I don't know how we're going to get this out to all of us, but we're going to go to Tom's basement. And we're going to steal it. <laughs> I, got a, I got a guy. <laughs> I got a guy. The funny thing is when we, when we went to put this in the bottle, uh, Mark called and said, you know, we have two options. We can do 90 proof or 100 proof. And I said, Wow, I didn't realize that you know there were barrels of ninety proof and barrel barrels of hundred proof. He said, "No, there's only there's only barrels of hundred proof." And I said, well, "How are we gonna get the ninety proof?" And he said, you "Pour have water to it." <laughs> <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't know that. A lot of people don't know that, I right? Didn't know that. I was like, "Well, that, that's pretty simple." It's so I watched these barrels come off at a distillery, and then they pour it in this big vat, and then they they have a ta a thing that tells them what the alcohol content is, and they just pour water in there to get it to to you know ninety, so they can sell it. But, well, anyway. my thought was if you got a hundred proof whiskey and you add water to it and make it ninety proof, you've got a lot more to sell. You got more to sell. <laughs> so that's like that's a lot more to down. bottle. At least another bottle, yeah. right? Another yeah. thirty, forty bucks. Um, so I want you to tell me, tell me, has there ever been something that uh, something that's happened to you in your life that's kind of been sort of like the the theme of what of how you've approached business? Has there been you know, I had a friend of mine, Kurt, and he was talking about how he worked at a gas station when we were 15 and 16, because I worked at the same gas station, and the guy trusted him, and he, yeah. and he, and trust became a real big factor with him and his customers. Is there ever, you have any story of anything that's happened to you? Well, I, I would say going back to high school, I worked on a construction site digging driveways uh, in the dead of summer with a flathead shovel. Where? In, in Atlanta. You went to he, Roswell High School, yeah, I think. I went to Roswell. Yeah, you know, I went to Roswell High School. School. Did you really? I'm a hornet. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Well, you came after me. I then. came just, just a hair, <laughs> just a little bit. But you know, I, I I started out working for a friend's father, and he put us on a job site, and we were digging driveways and driving a dump truck to the to the dump at Morgan Falls, and um, there was something about that experience, the heat, and the you know the people I was working with, who were all nice people, but. I just looked around and I was like, I don't think this is for me. Yeah. I, I think I need to I don't want to do this for the rest of my life. Yeah, I need I need to be inside. Um, that was a turning point of just like, I. It's a beautiful I, story. I just, they were wonderful people. And I, I did really appreciate the fact that these people had incredible freedom and were, were great craftsmen. But I just thought this just isn't for me. Um, and then, uh, so I went to college. I got out. I got a job uh, working for an insurance company. And I worked with this man named Red Gilbert who was probably 62 at the time. And Red was a, a crusty old guy. And when I got out and started working for them, he had he had all these rules. And one of his rules was you can't have a cell phone. I said, why can't I have a cell phone? If I pay for it, he said, no, you're not allowed to have a cell phone. So why not? He said, because you need to learn how to use a pay phone, learn how to use a phone book, and, and it's a rite of passage. So for the first year I was in business, he would make me drive into town and pull into a phone booth a gas and station and or something. Cut, yeah, and cut out all the pages out of the yellow pages and and take those back to the car and find the people I wanted to call on and then go stand in the phone booth in the heat or the rain and call these people to try to make appointments. And that's how I got my start. And it was miserable and, and it was irritating because all my friends had cell phones. Right. Yet it was a great way to learn like the core of the business, which was it's all about finding the right people to call on. And it's somewhat about paying your dues and standing there in the phone booth, you know, in the heat. So of the how rain. important is that that you spend your time with the people that can cha ching? I mean, a lot of people don't do that, right? They just dial for dollars, they buy yeah. leads. How important is that really drilling down to say this is where the meat is? Well, I think the challenge is for guys like you and me, uh, I'm willing to bet if I said, you know, I've got a I've got a developer over here who's, who's developing a, a subdivision and he needs somebody to do all the mortgages. You'd say, I can sell that. Yeah. Make, make an appointment. Let's go now. Right? Let's go right now. Let's yeah. go knock on his door. And, and I've always been that way. And I think maybe in my in my old age, I've, I've learned that sometimes that isn't always the best approach. So, hmm. you know, that I think you can channel that energy in a really positive way. You can also waste a lot of time with that energy. 
And I think that's one thing I've learned in the past few years. To focus the energy in the right spot. Right, because you know there are tons of opportunities that come your way and a good bit of them are just a waste of your time. And so you can convince yourself that you can close something because you're that's that good at selling when in reality it's not closable right uh, you don't okay, have a relationship so, you don't have the data you don't have the information you don't have the reputation when the volume's market. there the business is there it's but there. it's not the right business they're gonna you. buy from somebody but chances are it ain't gonna be you so how do you find that person that you need to spend your time um, in our business it is a long long process, three to four years of, of developing a relationship. And, and and these days, you know, that's taken a different form. So that used to be, you know, face to face and lunches and breakfasts and cocktails. Right. And, you know, frankly, in our business, people don't have time for that anymore. And, and, and you know, you want to know, just ask somebody to go get dinner. You know, they're, they're right. going to tell you no, they'd rather go home with their family. So we really have had to pivot and change how we market. And now we much, we market much differently. Um, using more platforms and and digital media, video. Um, so get, walk me through that. So like you've got this. How, so how do you determine who who that well is out there that yeah. you want to go get? So some of it is just database, it's just mining a database and trying to find where. So for us, we're looking for you know very large employers, and typically we're trying to find those that are working with our competition, perhaps the weakest of our competition. And we sort of hone in on those. So you put a lot of names, so to speak, or here's our list, or right? Our target market, right? And we just okay. are literally in the process of like taking the funnel, just you know, traditional sales, Bring down to like in. these are the A prospects. These are the people we want to develop relationships with. It doesn't mean we're not going to ever talk to the other people, but right. let's but let's hone it down, and then let's try to figure out a way. All we're trying to do with our prospects is simply just get on their radar. We want them to know who we are. So what would be your first? Inclination. Um, would you try to get a warm lead in there? Would we you would start try. Call or what? We, we would. We would absolutely try. So if you're to get gonna a get a warm lead, lead where yeah. would you go? Go to LinkedIn or how do you do we, that? We go to LinkedIn and try to back our way in. Okay. Um, we'd go to another advisor who might have a relationship, and us, we'd go to an intermediary. Like so, so, for example, we're insurance brokers. There could be an insurance company that does business with them. We might go to that insurance. How would company, you find that out? Uh, just start asking around. There's also some public databases where you can dig around and find who the okay. work, who the company. So we're trying to get people that with. can get us in there, warm up, warm up right. the conversation. Right. At least, at least give me the lay of the land. What's this person like? You know, are so they? So you've already determined who it is. Yep. You need to. We know who it is. Our buyer is Jim Smith because he, Smith, he's a, he does that yeah, for the company. Chief HR officer or the senior VP of HR or the you know director of comp and benefits. There's only a couple titles for us that are, are laser beamed in on. And now we gotta find a way to get in. Okay. And you know, and sometimes, you know, it's old school. It's just picking up the telephone. And and one of the things I found, I think this is fascinating, is that nobody uses a telephone anymore. So if nobody's using a telephone anymore, then isn't that the way we should be prospecting? Because nobody's calling. No. They're all emailing. They're scared they're, to call. They're scared to call. They're going to do digital. Which is, goes back to you being in the parking lot and cutting yeah. out the phone book. Yeah. That's right. Pick up the phone. And pick up the phone. And you know, even if you have to leave them 10 messages, hey, at least you're, you're, you're leaving them something. So when you get that prospect in your mind, are you just, I mean, you're just ferocious about it. You're yeah. not, well, I'm like a bull, so bull, I'm not letting go. We, ha we have to be careful because our sales cycle is so long that if we come in too hot, uh, they'll recoil and, and, and they'll stop taking your calls and they'll stop responding to your emails, they'll stop reading your stuff. Okay. So for us, it's sort of a drippy, leaky, you know, yeah. careful, long relationship build. But it's worth it. It's worth it. And, and I've done some really, you know, odd things uh, that, that at, at times have worked pretty well. So one of the ideas I had was, so nobody uses a telephone anymore, we agree on that. The other thing nobody does anymore is nobody writes people letters or writes some notes, right? I mean, when's the last time you got a handwritten note from somebody that you did business with thanking you for doing something? Everybody's gonna open a letter if they get it. So I started writing handwritten notes to people that I wanted to do business with. And just simply introducing myself, this is who I am, this is what I Give do. Give me an example. So, for example, I'd find somebody that's a you know chief HR officer at a, at a company with 3,000 employees, and I'd just write a little handwritten note on a note card. But know. like, how would you I, write I would, I would simply say, my name's Tom Green. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a consultant working with Alliant Atlanta, with 25 years of experience. I work with a number of your competitors. I'd like to meet you at some, t at some point if you're ever in the need, you know, have a need to change advisors. 
I've included my business card. Feel free to reach you out. You say anything about price? Nope. Nope. I just want because at that point I'm a consultant. I just want to know I'm on a I'm on a map. Oh. So I started doing that, and then you know, like most things with me, I got carried away. Um, <laughs> and I started writing. I started writing notes, and I made it made a goal to write a hundred, and I wrote a hundred. And you know, I'm talking put a stamp in the corner, write their name on the outside, drop them in the mail. Old school. Old school. And then I decided this is too much trouble. So I went online um, and I I found a contractor that, li that lives in India. And I, I contracted with her to write those notes for me. Brilliant. And I paid her 20, oh. 25 cents a piece. No yeah. way. And so this is all via email. What about the stamp though? Does she? I had to send her a box, which by the way, that was the most expensive part was shipping the box over there. I had to ship her the note cards, the envelopes, the stamps, and get this. She emailed me and said, you didn't put any pens in the box. Then I had to mail her pens because she didn't have a pen. So the, the funniest part of this whole thing is I, I thought, gosh, this might not go well. So I put out uh, on a platform called Upwork where you can go and find contractors all over the world. I actually put out the script of the note that I wanted written. And the interview process was to write the note and scan it and, and, send, it. and send it in because I wanted to see their handwriting. Yeah. But the handwriting was terrible. They were going to work, right? So oh, I actually God. hired this person because she had the best handwriting made by that, that sent anything back. And so I, I negotiated. Oh, my God. Y'all, that's a brilliant days. idea. So if you're a real estate agent in Atlanta, I'm going to hire this Indian lady to send you a note. <laughs> yeah. And hey, you know what? It, it looks like my handwriting. I don't know my handwriting, right? And and I had business 25 cards. 25 cents a name. 25 cents a name. And I did, I did a thousand of them at a time. So I'd have to send her a thousand business cards, a thousand note cards, a thousand stamps. What's that website? Five pins. Uh, Upwork. U P W O R K. Oh if you're I mean, honestly, if you're a, if you're a you know small business person and you haven't found Upwork yet, you're missing you out. To. Yeah, because there is nothing you need done as a small business person that you can't find on Upwork, and you there's nothing you can't find for 25 percent the cost if wow. you're willing if you're willing to trust somebody outside of the country to do it. But that, you know, in the big picture, that's not a big. What's the risk? Yeah, I mean, so yeah. why? I mean, we've done stupider yeah. things for oh, less I've money, Oh, I've done a lot right? of stupider things. <laughs> and and honestly, the way that system works is, uh, is is you have to fund the project in advance. So you have to say, all right, I'm gonna pay you, you know, two hundred fifty dollars to write a thousand notes, right? And you have to actually almost like earnest money, right? You got to put yeah. the money into the system, and then but but the system doesn't release it to that person until you say I'm happy with the work that was done, and then they release the money to them. So they don't get paid unless you, unless you don't happy. get paid unless you're happy. Yeah. So talk to me about. Um, Anything else you're doing marketing wise to get business? Or let me let me rephrase that. Let's say I'm a young guy and I come in, I come to work for you and I'm a rookie. What are the what are the marketing things you're gonna tell me to do? You know, I think unfortunately I think it's, it's it's similar to some of the things we've already talked about. It's it's trying to figure out um, who to go call. Who you're gonna call. I mean, I'll give you an example. Um, you know, our 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 group does you know, say $35 million a year in revenue. And a few years ago, we sat down and tried to figure out who are our buyers. And we didn't know. <laughs> I mean, we really didn't know. Like, you know, we knew who our at. clients were, but we didn't know who our buyers were. So yeah. to sit down and say, okay, I know I know who my clients are, but if I go out now and I look at the whole world and say, if I'm gonna target, who are my buyers? We did not have a database of buyers to, to for the next deal, right? Right. It was more word of mouth, referral, you know, hopefully, hopefully somebody moves from this job to this job and we get a referral. We didn't have an active process to go out there and market. So uh, we hired somebody and and we basically said, your, jo your job is to create a database with 3,000 people in it that would be buyers of our services. And then we're gonna go in and we're gonna basically hone that list down. And one of the things we built um, or, or we contracted with a third party firm, we identified some platforms where the simplest thing now, it seems like rocket science like five years ago, but to be able to, to send you, Steve, an email and know whether you opened it. It's the simplest thing in the world. I just want to know if you opened it. And that technology is, is, you know, is rampant now. It's right? everywhere now. But the idea that I can target people, so think about this for a minute. If I target a thousand people with blast emails and I don't know who's opening the email, my best prospect might not ever open my stuff or who I do, who I believe my best prospect mm. is the one I think is my next deal may never touch my but stuff. if they open it 
If they're not open and you're stuck, you got to ask the question, are they your best prospect or are they just feeding you a lot of bull or are you convincing yourself that's your best prospect, right? right? right. If I know you're opening that email, the technology's gotten better. Now, it not only can it tell you if, you if that person opened the email, it can tell you if they forwarded the email. It can tell you if they opened an attachment attached to the email. Do you call right? that person? That's a, that's <laughs> right. So now you now you basically take your funnel and you say, all right, I sent an email to a thousand people. Um, Nine hundred and sixty of them did not open my email. Right? I mean, just right. You know, it's probably probably about the right number. But the forty that did open, and how many of them clicked on the attachment, and how many of them forwarded that to somebody else? Well, now all of a sudden, I've got my A list, I've got B list, I've got the C list. Right? That's fantastic. Yeah, it, and that technology is not expensive. And you can, anybody can get that. You can get absolutely. You can absolutely get that technology out there right now. And all right. it works. So awesome. I'm leaving. He's gonna cut this out real quick. But I just want to say thank you. Hey. I, gotta go to the, I gotta go to the Braves game. Oh, you going to game? Yeah, I'm going to the game. Yeah, so you get it. You want some of this, Josh? Put it on the shirt. Sure. Yeah. This shit is good. Um, okay, it's good. This is money, by the way. This is money. Good. good. Oh, good. 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 I appreciate great. it. Yeah, this, this is, is really this is fun. Yeah. Uh, I meant to bring another bottle of that for you, and I just right. just to have it. Just because I mean I've got two cases of it in my garage. Well, he keeps yes, sending sir, cases of it. I'm like, stop yeah, sending it. I'll give you know. give my address. Yeah. Or I'll come pick it up. I can. Uh, I'll get it to you. We'll figure it out. We'll figure it out. Appreciate you. Uh, yeah, that's great. Cool. Good cool. seeing you. Dad, thanks, Josh, and man. Good I'm to see you, my late. brother. All right, we'll see talk y'all. soon. Enjoy the game. Go Braves. All right. So you. I want to talk to you about building your referral business. So you get a, you get a customer. How do we get that customer to refer us to other people? Or how do you find somebody that you play golf with or somebody yeah. that you know from Roswell High School or whatever? How do you get those people to refer you? What, what do you how do you think about that? Process? What's, what's amazing, and I, I know you know this, is is the biggest challenge to referrals is nobody asks for them. <laughs> right? <laughs> right. I mean, you just don't. No. Um, they don't. And it's... It's incredible, and I mean, I find myself in that position of, in fact, I, I it's funny, I asked a, a client recently if they would help me uh, meet somebody at one of their competitors. And uh, and his response was kind of interesting. He said, you know, I'm not sure, I gotta think about that a little bit. And I was like, well, I thought you were really happy with us. He said, well, I'm, we're very happy with you guys. But if I introduce you to them and they're as demanding as we are, I'm concerned that your team will get stretched too thin and not be able to give us the attention that we need. I'm like. Whoa. That is a great point. Now, whoa, we have a big firm, so it's not very likely that would happen, but it was, I could see where he's coming from. Of, yeah. Hey, you know what? I don't He feels special, and he thought, he I might not feel special. Right. I might all not of a sudden, be special. All of a sudden now, you guys are, are too distracted with a, with a brand new client, you know, and I become second chair. And I, I get that. Um, but, you know, I, I think the other thing is, um, as basic as it sounds, you know, LinkedIn, is pretty darn good at the you know the know somebody that knows somebody that knows somebody yeah, you know, the old yeah. Facebook. Um, yeah. I mean, it's pretty darn good if you know how yeah. to use it. Yeah. And and you know, I do also think LinkedIn has a lot of functionality in there that a lot of us don't really understand. But do you do anything like do you spend more time with them? Do you invite them to your house for dinner? Do you play golf with them? I mean, do you see there's there certain things you feel like you need to do to to make that relationship stronger with your current yeah. customers so that they'll what? um yeah i i do think um it's that old maxim of you know what is they don't they don't know how much you care until they care how much you know or whatever, <laughs> what, whatever but, it is but i you know i think for us a lot of it is um is is respecting the relationship and delivering above and beyond and then simply asking and so for us in our business, there's not a tremendous amount of entertainment that goes on. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I don't know why that is. It's just the way our business has always been. It's, you know, it's sort of business is done, you know, at the office. And, right. you know, you might get folks to go to dinner now and again or lunch every once in a while. But there's not a lot of going to Braves games and, and, and whining and dining people like the old but days. Do you have touch points for your customers through the process? Or We do. We do. And it kind of goes back to... Um, picking up the telephone and, and as simple as it sounds, um, you know, I, I've tried to get into the habit of just picking up the phone and calling our clients and saying, and, and, and chatting for three minutes and then saying, listen, I, I don't have an agenda today. I just was calling to check in and see how you're doing. It's 
strong, isn't it? Right. I mean, oh, and yeah. people are so appreciative, especially now with COVID and everything going on. I just check in and see how you're doing. How do you keep that database and know how to check in or who you're checking in with? You have a way you. So it. yeah, we do. We we use a, a platform. Uh, there's one called Upwork that we use. That's right. pretty good. It reminds you to call Jim it'll, Smith. It'll remind you to you know change your underwear. Whatever. Yeah, it's, change oil yeah. in your car. Yeah, yeah. It, it's almost it, honestly you have to take these technologies and like dumb them down because they're, they're they're really built for people that are on steroids. And I like I need 10 percent of what that thing can do. Uh, I just need it to tell me who to call and I need it to tell me if somebody opened my email. Right. I mean it's just simple stuff. But those are you know those platforms are pretty good at keeping you on task and and on point. It's also, they're great platforms for managing other people because you can look in the system and see, you know. It's like a Salesforce kind of thing. It's I absolutely think. like a Salesforce. Yeah, same All right. idea. So a lot of people that are small business people have a real struggle with going out and calling on whales, big, yeah. big customers. You seem to feel comfortable in that because I guess that's where, that's the most profitable piece for y'all, right? At a certain point. You, and, you, you and need somebody expertise. with a certain amount of volume yeah. or a certain amount of employees or whatever. What advice would you have for somebody that is, you know, like in my world, that'd be, hey, I do a lot of $500,000 purchases, but I want to yeah. do some two millions, you know? Yeah. How, do you, how do you transition that mentally the way you feel like you can play with the big boys, so to speak? Well, I, I've always said I'm, uh, and I mean this seriously, I've always said I'm two questions away from you finding out I have no idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's that's where I've always operated. And that's brilliant. And I've always been comfortable there. Um, in fact, I used to work with this guy, Terry Smith, who was a, a great friend. He was a good bit older than me. And uh, and he would take me out on, on meetings. And uh, we used to have a code and, and the code was Equifax. And, and that was when you're in a room full of people and, and and you're talking, you have the floor, right? And they're asking you questions and you're pontificating about things. And in our business, it's very easy. You know, you know a lot about a little bit, but it's very easy for somebody to pivot a little bit and kind of get you off go, your uh -oh. off your expertise. Yeah. But you don't want to go like, I don't, I don't know anything about that, you know? And so we had a we had a, a code and the code was, you know, that reminds me um, of something we did on Equifax. And then hopefully somebody else. In well, the, the room. code was to, to to the other guy that like I have no idea what I'm talking about. It's like you better jump in here quickly because if I don't, you know, if you don't save me, they're gonna figure out I don't know what I'm talking about. So we would use Equifax, and the other guy would always say, "Yeah, you know what? That does remind me of what we did on Equifax." And he would take it and and then like try to take it in a different direction. But we were always that's just where we operated. That is awesome. To me, that's just fun. You know, I mean, if you're not awesome. kind of if you're not on the edge of of what you know, it gets boring. So a lot of people are so uncomfortable with that, you know, and, and as you get more mature in your business, you re, you become, you start to realize, I tell younger people all the time, that it's okay to say, you know what, I really don't know. Yeah, or, so it's a great segue. Uh, I, I've been reading this, this book, um, I'll let you share it, but Think Again by Adam Grant. One of, he's my favorite. Isn't he great? He's, he's awesome. Yeah, he's really good. and. A warden psychologist. Right? Yes, and uh, and you may know I have a I have a blog site where I write uh, mainly about health and well being topics, but a lot of it is just sort of general life advice. And uh, it's Tom Green with an E dot com, and uh, I I got turned on to this guy, and and it got me really thinking on the subject. And I just wrote something that I submitted to the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, and Washington Post. Um, it's basically a piece talking about how how rare it is in today's day and age, someone will admit they don't know something. It, it, it's absolutely uncanny how expert everybody is in everything. Yeah, it's crazy, isn't it? It's crazy, and it, and it kind of goes in a different direction of people have become so such experts and they're so dug into their positions that they don't listen anymore. And in reality, they don't know what they don't know. Right. But yet they're still incredibly confident that they're right. Right. And so this book basically talks about the power of of knowing what you don't know. And listening. And listening. And being open to other people's Right. And so I I use the, I use the example of, of of a faith life. Right. And how how difficult it is today to have a, a faith life because so many people around you are so convinced that it's it's all make believe. Mm -hmm. And 
and they don't know any more than I do. I don't know. I don't know. I didn't get a degree in theology, you know, but you didn't get a degree in theology either, you know? Right. And so it, I just find it fascinating how people can talk so often so firmly about what they know when really they know very little. So is product knowledge more important or is enthusiasm more important when you're selling something? So in our world, um, I think it's enthusiasm. Um, I think it's also knowing, you know, when you don't know what you're talking about. Right. I mean, I joke, jokingly tell the Equifax story, but honestly, for me, um, I would much rather say, you know what, that's a great question. You know, I have somebody in my office uh, I think you're really going to enjoy talking to. And, and to me, that's magic, right? Because now all of a sudden you want to talk to, you're done talking to me, right? Yeah. I, and by the way, I don't, I have, I'm running out I of stuff I agree with you 100%. But if I can get you to somebody else that's the expert on the subject, now we've got a second but meeting. But so many of these young folks go out and they, they're like, they like they can't go sell because I don't have my business card yeah. and I don't have enough product knowledge. Yeah. And they don't understand that that really isn't yeah. as big a deal as they think it is. Well, and 99% of the time, the buyer is not going to know more than you do. You know? so, I mean, <laughs> even you even know, if you don't know anything. Right, you don't know anything. I mean, because the buyer is just you know looking for somebody, a lot of times just looking for somebody to do a job, right? right. And in my role, you know, I, I like to jokingly say, I'm in charge of the hello and the goodbye anyway, right? It's all the stuff in the middle that somebody else is responsible for. So, you know, I, I just want to get people to the right people. Um, and I know in my world, if I can get my people in front of the buyer, I don't have, you know, I can back off because they're so good at what they do. I know they'll wow the prospect. Yeah, you, you feel confident about it. Totally your confident. All right, let's go to mental health, but I, I, I want to know what you're doing in that field, but I want to know... I call it the tapes you play in your head. I, yeah. I wrote a book about, I've, I've, I've discovered that highly successful people are really good about having these conversations with themselves to propel them through the moment or propel yeah. them to where they're going. Do you have a certain conversation you have with yourself or certain sayings or stuff you've heard from people that you rehash? Like a friend of mine that went to Roswell School and, um, I don't know if you're, uh, if you remember this cat, this kid named Tony Phillips. So he was my age. He played. He went and played major league baseball, and, oh, wow. he, and and he told me that you know that he always said, you know, my shit always works out. Yeah, yeah. And he just yeah. had that yeah. saying yeah. that every he got somewhere, and he he's like he just kept saying it, and yeah. it worked out. Yeah. yeah. Do you have anything like that that you, you know, one of the thoughts things, and stuff? One of the things I I think that was hard for me is. Um, I went to Roswell High School, right? I mean, I didn't go to Exeter or something. You know? right, I, right. I mean, I went to public high school. Right. I went to public university. And I was a C student. And um, and and so for me, like my secret to my success, I've just worked my ass off, right? Right. I mean, I really have. I've worked incredibly hard. But I think for guys like us, you get to a point where you go like, oh, I've done pretty well, but but it's just kind of fluky. You know, just I don't really deserve this. I don't really deserve to be here. Um, and there's a... a a great guy that uh, is a friend of mine named Tommy Newberry. Yeah. Uh, who's written a couple of yeah, no fantastic time. books. Uh, Success is Not an Accident is the one, my favorite. One of my favorite books I've ever read. Um, and, and I and I work with Tommy. He helps helps me and coaches me, um, tries to make me better at what I do right. in, in basically every a- aspect of my life. But I think the title of that book, Success is Not an Accident. You know, it's not. No. I mean, you deserve to be there. And... And you are as good as you think you are. So you're talking to yourself that I've put in the work to be here. Right. And no one else is going to work harder than I am. And no one else is surrounded by better people. I'm going to outwork you. I'm going to outwork you. I'm going to outflank you. I'm going out, to outrun you. And, But I think, you know, sometimes it's hard to get yourself, you know, over that hump mm-hmm. of, I deserve to be here. You know, I, I've earned That's my seat at the table. And he when has... Did you, when did you feel like you deserved to be here? You know, I don't... I don't think I did until I started working with Tommy, and he has a he has a, a, a it's it's a it's interesting because it's a little cultish, but he has these these uh, recordings that he that he plays where you know you're basically it's it's theoretically you're talking to yourself and you're saying like you know I can do it I can do it I believe yeah. in myself yeah and and what I find affirmations there are affirmations and what I find uh, where I find myself using those the most is when I'm playing golf. Because, you know, if you're a golfer, 
It's very, you can yeah. have a great day and you can have one hole and the next thing you know, you're like, you are just beating yourself. If, if you were sitting next to you on an airplane, you'd punch you in the nose. Yeah, right, you know? right. I mean, you would never let somebody talk to you the way you talk to yourself. Right. And yet, we will just beat ourselves up over the simplest things. And so I find myself on the golf course, you know, having to kind of talk my, my way through uh, mentally that, you know, that I am good at this game. And I, I have put in the time and the energy and the effort. Um, I've hit the balls. I've hit the balls and I've, I've taken the lessons and I, you know, I've got the right equipment and, you know, this positive thoughts instead of, you know, God, you suck, you know, which is, you hear people say on a golf course all the time, they hit a bad ball today. Ah, I just suck. You, you don't do this for a living, you know? I mean, come on, you play. Right, it's supposed to be for fun. Right, you play 20 times a year. I mean, come on. <laughs> you know, you're, you're not, you know, you just win the Masters. Right. So I, I think there's a lot. When I first started working with Tommy and he started down that path, I thought, this is weird. Um, and then the more I thought about sort of the way we talk to ourselves and that voice in our head, um, I really do think that's, there's a lot there. There's a lot of I power think it's, in that. I think it's the main thing. Yeah. If you can't get excited about going and doing yeah. and learning and whatever it is, you know, it's kind of that thing where if you don't, you don't have that island you're swimming to, you're never yeah. going to get yeah. to that island, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, think about it. if you had somebody, if you had a coworker who followed you around everywhere you went and and basically told you you suck at everything you do. You believe you suck? I believe them after a while, and yet that's what we did ourselves because it's just habit. And so I've I've really worked on that in the past couple of years of trying to um, trying to just have a positive self talk, a better conversation, some soundtrack. You know, is is a positive soundtrack instead of a negative soundtrack. And and it's it's amazing what that does for your for everything for energy for for your outlook. Um, That's amazing. That's, I yeah, really... it, it's it's amazing. So you wrote a book, right? So what, well, tell I, me about that. I did. I wrote. So it was a funny story. I wrote a book with my daughter. Um, and uh, it was a children's book. And it started with me coming in her room at night. She was about, you know, five. And I would, she'd say, tell me a story. And so I'd start telling a story. Um, and then I run out of stuff to talk about, right? I mean, I, after a while, the story gets kind of stale. And I'd say, well, why don't you take it from here? Tell me what happens next. And so she would take it and tell me what happens next. And so then, you'd start the story? Yeah. And then she'd end yeah. it? Yeah, yeah. And, and, and I would say, you, you go. And then she would talk for a minute and tell me what she thinks happened. And then she'd go, hey, you go. And I would pick, okay, well, what happens next is they, you know, they go down to the beach and, um, and they find this luau and they go to the luau and, um, and they eat dinner and, and then somebody tips over a table and the cats run in and, you know, it, this story just kept growing and growing and growing until finally I said, you know, this stuff's getting pretty good. We better write this down. So I started writing it down at night after I would, we would talk. I'd wow. go back, you know, when I go to bed, I would sit down and write down what happened in the story that night. And ultimately I, I started typing it up. Uh, and it ended up being a hundred page children's book. And so for her, for Christmas, uh, I actually had it published Wow! and, uh, and gave her a hundred copies of the book. Wow. For Christmas. And, and then it, she was able to give it to all of her friends. And so it's, you know, and the funny thing is I bought a thousand copies, which is really dumb. So I've got about 600 copies of that along with the whiskey in my house. If you, if you like some whiskey. I'm going to, I'm going to do book. some of this, uh, uh, bathtub whiskey. Right yeah, that, that is. That's a, that's a good bath water. All right, now, now tell me about your blog. So what got you wanting to do a blog? Um, so I started the blog about two years ago. Uh, I've always done a lot of writing. Uh, and I used to write a lot on LinkedIn and Medium and these you know, internet sites. Were you in journal, journalism? No, I just, I've just i just always been, it's always been easy for me to write. So that's interesting. I've always thought, you know, That's like a root canal for me. Yeah, it, it, well, that's right. For some people, it's it's a root canal. And for other people, for me, I'm like, you only way to write about it, give me 15 minutes, you know? Yeah. And, and and I can literally take a topic um, and it just comes naturally to me. So I took this topic last week of, of the fact that people are so confident in what they know, even though they know very little. And I wrote, you know, a, a thousand words in 30 minutes. Uh, and it was good. You know, I read it. I was like, that's, that's pretty good. You know, I'm, <laughs> not bad. Good. I think I'll send that in the New York Times. Uh, but um, but I started writing mainly because I felt like there are so many men in their, you know, 40 plus, 40 to 65 uh, that are really struggling, really, really struggling. And they have nobody to talk to. And so there's this great book uh, published in 1986 called um, The Friendless American Male. And That's interesting. I read that book and then I started thinking about how many men in our country 
literally have no friends. Wow. And, and some of that's been a generational shift from- Do you run into those guys in yeah. your business? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, It's absolutely. like they come in, they go to their cubicle, and they go home, they eat dinner, and they watch TV, and they go to bed. Yeah, just, I mean, or people that, you they're know- They're not in the bottom they, of their church, not bottom yeah, of their Yeah, right, they moved, they moved to a new city, right? And, 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 they, and they met somebody, and they got married, and they never developed any friendships there. And then start having kids, right? And then work was demanding. And next thing you know, they're 45 and they go, I have no friends. I got, you know, I have friends from college, but I lost track of them. And I also think that in males um, today, um, it is so frowned on to have friendships. So think about it, you know, when you're 35 years old and you got two kids at home and they're young and you tell your wife, like uh, tonight I'm gonna go out with my friends and have dinner and play darts. You know, and your wife, like, you lost your mind. You know, you're not doing that. She's gonna say, I wish I could do that. Right, and 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 so guys, don't do that. Well, women right? have a little bit of the same problem, well, especially when you have young kids, right? It's very difficult for, for both of you, it's very difficult. But what I found is where where, where women ultimately um, sort of revert to like bunko groups and, right. and, and dinner clubs and, and different things and card groups, dice games. The men just, once they lose that friendship, they don't, they're done. Wow. They're done. They and never go back. They never go back. And so you wind up with these guys that are 45 and 50 and they start really struggling because they have all these big questions about life and they don't have anybody to talk to about them. And that's about the age where you start thinking about what's this really all about. Yeah. Right. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So I started writing sort of this. I didn't really know what I was doing when I started it. I just started writing uh, different articles and I started getting really great feedback from folks. So I, I wrote more. And so then I decided, well, I'm going to I'm going to put this out there. Uh, I'm going to create a website, and put it out. And so I made a deal with myself that I wouldn't put it out until I had written 50 articles. Wow. So you banked 50 articles 50. before yeah. you even put it out. Yeah. Before I even were put you it out. emailing those articles to your friends and stuff? Nope. They were just, just only, only known to you. Only known to me. I didn't share them with anybody. I literally would write, um, I'd get them, I'd get them to a point where I thought they're about 85% done. And I'd say, okay, that one's done. And I put it aside because my thought was I don't want to create a website and, and and blast three articles and get fanfare about it and everybody tells you what a great job you're doing, boy, you're a great writer, and then lose interest, you know, and then it becomes embarrassing. You like, felt like it, you wanted it to go in to succeed. Yeah, and I didn't want to I didn't want to create it. Now see that's interesting to me because I'm totally the opposite. I, mean, I heard Seth Godin one time. I went we went to one of his classes in yeah. New York and he's yeah. like, people get all concerned about doing something and they it's got to be perfect and yeah. he said just ship it yeah just yeah. do it and yeah. ship it yeah. and i've never forgotten about yeah. that and i'm a little add and like so i every time i do something i don't even i just yeah. do it yeah and throw it out there and you're yeah. just the opposite you want it to be you're more like my wife she wants it to be right and done right and look good well and to me it was less about it being perfect um and it was it was more about making the commitment that I'm going to do this. Okay, right? so that was a personal thing. Well, it was a personal thing because what I didn't want, you know, I have plenty of things to give me stress, right? right. I got I got work and I've got I've got businesses that I invest in and I've got a family. You know, I got plenty of things that that give me stress. And I thought if I'm going to do this, I do not want this to create one minute of stress in my life. Because at the you point, want that to be pleasurable. I, I want it to be right. fun. I like to write. I want to help people. But you know, at the point where I'm, 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 you know, you know, staring over a laptop, you know, frustrated that I can't get the words to come out, it's no longer fun. So, how, how? I mean, you're involved in a lot of different stuff, right? I mean, yeah. so because of my, my sons, I know you're involved in uh, helping some some of these young men at Sigma New University yeah. of Georgia. I think you sit on uh, alumni board or yeah. something. You've done some of that. You're, you know. You're one of the main guys in your company. You've got this whiskey business. What yeah. what else are you involved in? Uh, so it kind of goes back to, uh, I had my, my first business I started in 2004. I sold it in 2007. After I sold it, um, my brother-in-law came to me uh, and said, hey, I got an idea for this medical device business I want to start. And I, I listened to him. Sounds great. You know, I think you ought to do it. You know, it's a two hour conversation. And it sounds like you're giving this a lot of talk. Well, so that was like a Friday. He came back in my office again on Monday. So I would talk to you some more about this. And I said, okay, so we talked for another two hours. And then he would just periodically drop into my office and want to talk about this medical device business. And this went on for three months. And I'd look up, he'd be standing in my doorway. 
And I had just sold my business to a larger firm and I was like, I got work to do. So finally, after about three months of that, I sat him down in the conference room in the nicest way possible. I said, I, you know, I love you like a brother, but honestly, you gotta get the hell out of my office. And you need to do this thing or don't do this thing, but you can't come back here anymore and talk to me about it because I, I'm- You gotta jump in or, or you, not. You gotta jump in or not. And you sold me within the first hour that you brought this up to me and the rest of it's just been wasting time. He was procrastinating, he was scared. He didn't, couldn't make a decision. So I got out my checkbook and I said, I will write you a check right now for $250,000, but you're never coming back here again to talk about this business. Well, you write me a check for $250,000. Yeah, look, 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 yeah, you haven't hit me hard enough yet. <laughs> so that's a true story. I was shareholder number one in this business. And? And he went home that night and said, uh, told his wife, I'm gonna quit my job. And I'm in. And I'm gonna start this business. And you're, and she said, well, how are we gonna pay eat. for eat? Or, and he said, well, your brother gave me $250,000. <laughs> I think she was mad, but it all worked out. It all worked out fine. But, but that was the first, you know, beyond owning my own business and running it, that was the first time investment I investment in somebody. I'd, right, I made an investment. You in, obviously in felt like he was worthy of an investment. I just, you know what? I felt like he would have done that for me. I know he would have. I know he would have. That's awesome. Um, and, and he's a passionate guy. And I thought, I don't know if this is going to turn into anything. I don't. Don't wanna... you love helping passionate people? Oh man, it was it was it was amazing. And so I ended up serving on the board, and we ran that company for seven or eight years and sold it to um, so it made money sold it to a private equity firm for 165 million dollars <laughs> so <laughs> i got my money back i love um, it and he had you know in hindsight i look back on it now i go that was the dumbest 250 so you took that money and read. went into the whiskey business <laughs> yeah yeah so we ended up we ended up doing that business and then we've had a number of spinoffs from that uh, mainly with in the him? healthcare, yeah, mainly in the healthcare arena. So but, you kind of got this side hustle yeah, with your side hustle. brother-in-law. And a lot of times, it's just somebody will come forward with an idea, uh, and they need money, or they need, you know, they need, you know, they need backers, and we'll help them kind of find money. That's awesome. And then we'll we'll make an investment in the business, and and sometimes we'll sit on the board. And these aren't, you know, these aren't Fortune 500 companies. These are these are small businesses that just need they need a little extra cash. And a lot of times people have novel ideas, they don't know what to do with it. How do you, I mean, I run into that all the time, but how do you, what's your deciding factor on them? I'm back in this horse or not? So, um, I got ADD, uh, just just like you, right? Right. And, and uh, so my attention span is pretty limited. And if they don't, can't grab me quick, I'm out. I'm out, uh, because if I, well, if I can't understand it at all, uh, I probably shouldn't invest in it. Uh, so a lot of times I'm investing I'd say 80% of the time I'm investing in the person, you know, yeah. just, do you believe that? Do you believe this person, yeah. what they're saying? And, um, are they honest? Do they, do they, do they really have a passion for what they're doing? Is it what they're doing really novel? They and, have it in their gut. They're just yeah. excited as hell about it. And for me, it's, it, it's a gut thing, you know, and I, I can tell you, I've, I've met with people where literally immediately I said, you know, there's no way I'm going to invest any money. You're an idiot, you know, <laughs> or you don't know what you're doing or you're, you know, you, it's not a match. I don't understand but the business. But is that a personality thing? It could be. It could be. Um, but, you know, there's a lot I of... worry about that because there are a lot of really bright people with bright ideas yeah. that are boring as hell to yes. me. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, right. And so to me... Like if you're a CFO accountant kind of guy... Right. I, it's not that interesting. I've yeah. been some kid, he's ADD, and he's jumping and he's ready to go. I, I get excited about that. Yeah. yeah. That's right. And that's sort of the way I've always approached it is if, if you can get me excited about it, um, you got a shot. <laughs> you got a shot. Cause I don't look. I, you know, we're not trying to make ten billion dollars here, right? We're just trying to create a business and and get it big enough to where we can sell it to somebody else. You know, greater greater pool. Yeah. And sometimes it works, and sometimes it doesn't. You know. It, right. I mean, I invested in an oil drilling business in, in uh, Texas, and it didn't work out so high. <laughs> it didn't go good. Uh, so you know, they they don't all work out. You only talk about the ones that really work out well. But you know, a lot of them just face plant. You know, you just write it off. And that's part of the rolling the dice piece, right? Right. All right. Right. So, um, I'm going to taste this just to make sure it's really good. Yeah. That's awesome. Bad. Might how important is these participations in these other extracurricular things? How important is that? Sigma Nu, boards, yeah. church, golf yeah. club. How important is that to your business? Um, I think it's really important. I mean, frankly, you and I wouldn't be sitting here talking right, if I wasn't involved with your sons when they were in college. Right. Um, and 
you're fortunate to have two two great sons. And, thank you. and any mistakes that they make are not a reflection they take on after their mama. Yeah, 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 that's right, right. Um, but I, you know, some of that's just, some of those things you do are just for credibility purposes, you know, and I think right. you never know who's watching. Um, you just never know who's well, reason watching. Well, the reason why I bring this up is when, I, when I've really interviewed highly successful people, one of the things that I found out, these are people that are doing business in their communities. Yeah. What I have found is that the guys that are really, really the top, top, top guys, yeah, they're they're you know they're 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 in their church, they're teaching a Sunday school class, they're at the ball field, they're in yeah. the Rotary Club, they're on yeah. the Chamber of Commerce, they're on a, they're yeah. something with their school, they're alumni, and I mean you kind of fit that a little bit. I yeah. mean, don't you think that is something to be said for that? I think there is, and 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 um, and yet if I go back and look at my career, you know, very little of uh, of of what I've accomplished came out of all of that. Right. It's kind of interesting. That is interesting. Um, you know, you would you think- You don't see the direct sale component I, I, coming from it. I don't, um, I don't. Some of it is, you know, our target buyer um, is, a, is a finite capacity, you know, qu quantity. So, I mean, you take a, a group of 10,000 employees, there are about three people there that can hire me, right? Right. And so you're talking about a needle in a haystack. And so if you take your church or you take, you know, you take your, your country club, you know, there's only, if you're lucky, there's Just two or three people. Just guy that's in your Sunday school class works at Equifax doesn't mean you're going to get that. Doesn't mean you're going to get that business. That's exactly right. But, so. you know, I, that, I, I wrote a book about buzz. And what I found is that there's a buzz about every one of us. And, and when somebody talks about you, what they say about you is what I call your buzz, yeah, right? Right. And so I think, I mean, you tell me what you think. I think all of that stuff comes into play with the yeah. buzz at the right time. Do yeah. you think? Yeah, that's why I say it's it's more reputational, right? Uh, you call, okay, reputational. Yeah. So I call it, it buzz. Yeah, I mean, it's the same thing. It's the same thing of of uh, you know, there is a certain reputation you're 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 developing out there, you know, separate and apart from your business. But when somebody in business is looking into you and trying to figure out who you are and what you do, they're doing their due diligence. Right. On you. And you know, I I don't want anybody to ever go look for anything about me on the on the interwebs and, and say, dude, I didn't know that guy was involved in that, right? Yeah. Um, I wanted to look and go, oh my gosh, I didn't realize this guy was involved in so many other good things. Right. So do you take when you get the opportunity or somebody asks you to be involved with something like that? How do you assess, okay, I want to be on that board or no, that's not something yeah. I want. Um, well, early on, I said yes to everything. Um, and, and and that helps you decide when to say no. Yeah, it? yeah, it backfired. Um, and especially, I, I, I joke that my pastor is a very good friend of mine. And I always say like, y'all are the worst. I mean, as soon as, as, soon as you raise your hand, like, oh, we got, we got a guy over here, you know, he'll do it. And, and next thing you know, you're on four different boards, right? right. I and mean, that's just the way it works. And, and so I finally had to say, you know, I got to put the brakes on for a little while because I, I just, you know, I'm going to get burned out on church, you know, because right. I'm running a business of a church instead of going to church for the reason that's I'm really you're inside baseball in the church and Man, that makes it, you know, tough. you don't want to see the church make a sausage, you know, no, it's, I mean, tough. It's, it's just hard. I mean, you only, <laughs> you just want to get so far in and then, yeah. you know, then it's better to, you know, just step out and let somebody else come in. So what, what's your purpose for being here? Why, why has God got you here? What, what do you think you're supposed to do while you're here? Um, that's a good, really good question. Uh, I think I'm here to help people. In what capacity? Well, you know, I I, I probably would have had a different answer for you pre-50, right? Right. Um, uh, it would have been something effective, you know, uh, develop a good career and have a family and and uh, and, and provide for them, right? You know, right. the usual, you know, right. fill in the blank. Um, and I think at some point you cross over from that and you say, okay, you know, sort of box check, like the kids are sort of on their path, right? Mm -hmm. And like, I can't screw them up anymore now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and I feel like I've done what I'm supposed, done to, do what I'm supposed to do. Yeah. A bit, my business is good. Yeah. Um, uh, I've made it. I've made it. Right. Certain. As my wife says, when we were first married, every time I would hear a, a truck backing up in the neighborhood, you know, when it beep, beep, beeps and it backs up, she'd say, you, you think they're coming for our stuff, don't you? <laughs> And that's true. I did. I thought for until I was probably 45 that like any minute the truck was going to back up, you know, they did a flatbed truck and start loading our furniture. Um, it's just the way, it's just the way I was raised and, and, and the way I, I thought about life. And I think, so at some point you get some degree of success and you go, okay, well, flatbed truck's not coming. Um, and the family is in good shape. Um, business is in good shape. What am I really here for? Yeah. Right. That's what I'm talking about. And, 
Uh, and I had a hard time with that for a long time. Uh, and it's one of the reasons why I met Tommy Newberry was- uh, Searching for that. Well, I called him and I said, I, I, you know, I keep seeing your name in the newspaper and I've read some of your books and I don't really understand what you do. And he said, well, I help people you know, reach higher levels of success. And I said, well, I think I'm doing okay. And he said, well, what if you could do better? And I said, well, that's a good point. You know, uh, and he said, do you, do you really know what you're here for? And I said, I, I, don't, I don't know. Said, then you don't. And he was right. So uh, I, I'll never forget this. I was driving down the road. I'd had a meeting over on the west side of Atlanta. And I was driving down the road and I called him. And I said, I'm really struggling. We've been working together for two years. And I still don't know what I'm supposed to be doing. I don't know why I'm here. And you were supposed to help me figure that out. And this is classic, right? This is to turn the question back on the on the person. And he said, we're on the phone, I'm driving along, and I, and I was nice about it, but I said, I just don't right. I feel like I'm any closer to figuring out than I was when we started working together. You said you were gonna help me figure this out. And, you know, I, I just I just don't know if I'm making any progress or not. And he said, well, what do you wanna do? And I said, well, I wanna help people. And he said, well, how do you wanna do that? And I said, well, I like some of the stuff you do. I like, I'd like to write and, and speak and, and, uh, um, and, and I think that's what I like what I like to do. And he said, well, then why aren't you doing it? And I said, well, what would I write about? And he said, I don't know. Why don't you sit down to the laptop and start writing and see what comes out? That's a true story. And I sat wow. down and I started writing that night. I, I, wrote, a, I wrote a little piece and, uh, and man, it just started. It's, Pouring out. It just, it was unbelievable. And it now it's just like easy. I and now it's it. so easy. I mean, I could, if you gave me a topic, if you handed me this book and said, I give you an hour, I could bring you back a thousand words on that book. Now, it, now I'm not bragging. I'm just saying, no, we all have, we all have our skills talents. and talents. And yeah. sometimes it takes you a long time to figure but out what well, they you are. would also turn that into what your purpose is a little bit. Oh, absolutely. Right? And that is kind of yeah. more of helping people writing about what I'm helping people. I'm, I'm as simple as I can put it. I'm writing life advice. Simple. That's awesome. And so my pastor, it was funny, we were playing golf a couple months ago and uh, somebody somebody mentioned uh, my, my website and one of the four guys we were playing with said, well, what do you write about? And my pastor said, he writes about the things we're all thinking about but nobody says out loud. Oh. It's like, I gotta write that down. Oh, did you uh, did? That was powerful. I mean, that because it's true. Yeah, no, that's kind of like a tagline. Yeah, yeah, it was a, it, it was very helpful for me because I had a hard time that answering that question. That helped you kind of see Synthesize it. what is it I'm doing here. That's because again, so I, even though I was writing and I had, you know, I can I can have 30,000 people read a piece on a Tuesday, right? Right. I, mean, I can drive a lot of, uh, of eyeballs, but I still was questioning like, what is it I'm writing about? You know, what is my, what's my focus? What's my purpose? Does that, and he helped me figure that out. Change the game for you on how now you look at your life. Yeah. It's, it's yeah, different yeah. now. Isn't yeah. It? Yeah. It does. Um, and again, I think one of the challenges guys like us have and, and other folks who are entrepreneurs is, um, you can take something that's fun and you can turn it into stress and, and worry in a business real quick. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and so for me, it was like, I just want to help people. And I, for a while, I got really hung up on, well, I had 35,000 visitors on my website last month and I only had right. 25,000 this month. I, people must not, must not be reading my stuff. And, you, know, you just gotta let that go. Right. Um, and what I really wanted to do is just write really good stuff. Um, and if they look at it fine, if they don't, yeah. it's fine. Cause it mostly was for you. Well, that's, that's the realization I came to is in fact, one of my buddies was giving me a hard time and saying, uh, you know, why, why do you write all this stuff? I mean, and he was giving me a hard time. He said, Nobody reads your stuff, you know? And I said, that's okay. It's just for me anyway. So here's what's cool about that for me. So I feel like that, that my purpose is I'm here to help people get from where they are to where they want to go. Yeah. So I started out, I'm here to help. Yeah. And then I added that piece later as I researched it in my mind. And so now what happens to me, like I got really, really fed up with the mortgage business back there and all these bad times yeah. we had the last two okay. years and we weren't making money and it wasn't fun and we were getting more regulation. And I said, no, I'm here to help this person that's living here and they want to live here. Yeah. I'm yeah. here to help them get yeah. from where they are to yeah. where they want to go. It's not about the money. Yeah. 
right? Yep. And then, and then I found out that I could be in a restaurant and I could overhear somebody talking and I could think to myself, you know what? That's something I know something about. Yeah. And I would turn around yeah. in my chair and I <laughs> yeah. go, hey, I, I'm sorry. I overheard you talking about X. <laughs> right. right. Let me, let me yeah. jump in on this. Yeah. Yeah. And before I'd say, yeah. what? who are you to be an ass to think you can do that? Yeah. But now once I kind of see my purpose on why yeah. I'm here, I don't care. Yeah. Yeah. And and I'm just insert myself at the place that it's just almost like it shows up and I'm supposed to be there yeah. to insert this whatever well, knowledge I have. You know, obviously you got Brene Brown up there on your board. Yeah. Um, That's my list of people I want to meet. That's wonderful. Um, and, and that makes me think about, about her. She's awesome too. She's amazing. And, and I think it's one of the things that, you know, sort of post 50 is, <clears throat> I mean, if you told me at like 35, I was going to be writing like life advice online and, you know, you that and get, getting picked up by all these, you know, touchy feely digital magazines, they'd be like, you lost your mind. Um, and now I, I, there's, there's, I just don't care. You know, I, I feel like if I've got something to say, I'm going to say it. Now I'm not going to say anything can make them mad, right? Um, or too mad. Um, no, but you're gonna you're gonna dwell on. I mean, come back from these life experiences, yes. and you're gonna do your research, and yes. you're gonna learn a little something while yes. you're writing, I am. right? I am, and I'm a, and I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you stuff. If it's happened to me, I'm gonna tell you about because I I don't care, right? Right. And that's sort of the Brene Brown vulnerability of just sort of you know just being you know letting it being fly, open, being open, and, and look, hey, you know, I didn't always have it all figured out, um, and and, and here's kind of how I handled that. And here's how I sort of found direction. And, and I think that, I think there, you know, just back to my story about Tommy Newberry. I mean, I think there are a ton of guys our age that's, that, are, that have been working for 25 or 30 years and are still going, I just don't know what I want to do with my life. You, yeah. know? <laughs> you know, you better figure it out pretty soon, you know, because. Right. And, but but you know, real. I don't know. It's the it's uh, what I came to believe that it wasn't for me. It wasn't the mortgage business. You know, I thought that I needed to love and enjoy and yeah. be this guru yeah. in the mortgage business, and and I kind of got to the point where it really wasn't the widget that I was selling because yeah. I could sell whiskey or, yeah, that's right. or the bank. My purpose is here to help people get from where they are to where they want to yeah. go. That might be helping Adam Grant get to his next yeah. book. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Or this guy get to his next retailer. It really wasn't about the widget. And then what happened when I did that, then the widget kind of became fun yeah. again. Yeah. I had a guy tell me when I was right out of college, uh, in some sales training, he said, you know, this business goes up and down. And he said, but you know, you could, you could pack me and my wife and my two kids and my dog on a 747 with everything we own. And you could fly it over the middle of the country and so you could shove everything out of the back of the airplane. He said, give me about four months. I'll be in a business selling something. <laughs> no, that was just, that was, you know, at 20, and he's right. 25 years old, I was like, that's kind of cool. Yeah. And he was right. He he's right. But, but, but again, to your point of like, uh, and I think that's one of the challenges our young people have today is uh, I, I, I think they've been trained um, and it's been drilled in their head that they have to have a passion for what they do. Mm -mm. Um, and you know what? You didn't wake up one day saying, you know what? I've got a passion for more. I didn't wake up one day saying I got a passion for employee benefits. Um, we just sort of started going down a path and then the passion sort of developed around it. And, and I think that's tough for young people, right? Because I think there are a lot of young people who are like, well, I just, I don't know what I'm supposed to do because I haven't really found my passion yet. Well, see, that's why to me, it, passion is different than purpose. Yeah. And so yeah. when I work with young people, I get them to start thinking more about you know, because like, like I'm a, I love riding my motorcycle and I'm passionate about that, but that's not why I'm here to take people on motorcycle rides, yeah. right? Yeah. Or to own a motorcycle dealership and introduce people to it. My purpose is different than my passion. I say that there are very few people in the world that is, whose passion and purpose collide. Right. And if they do, you're Michael Jackson, right. you're Elvis right. Presley, right? Right. Those are the lucky, yeah. lucky people yeah. in the world. And, and, and sometimes we can get there, but I think we can be passionate about something and not have that be our life purpose. Right. So my daughter is a sophomore in college and she, she goes to Auburn and she works in the honors college and she got a little job there. You know, it's kind of the front person, you know, right. you walk in and she's the person you meet, the receptionist basically. And, uh, and she said, you know, I've been there. She told me the other day, I've been there three months. And she said, I'm, I'm comfortable there now. And she said, you know, people walk in the door and they need stuff and I can help them. 
And she said, you know, a lot of times like, I have the answers. Like, you know, they want to know about a tour or, you know, and sometimes I'll take them on a tour if there's nobody available. And she's like, I just really like helping people. And I, that was my point. Exactly my example of yes. it has nothing to do with the fact of where you're working. It's the fact you're helping people. Exactly. And, you know, you, you can you can get a ton of reward out of helping people no matter what you're doing. And I think that's key because you either like helping, you like coaching, you like teaching, you like discovering things. I mean, there's all these little, I call them 40,000 foot sort of things and kind of find your lane and then take the next piece of that. I like helping people. Well, what is it you like right. helping people right. do? If you get that next little right. sentence, yeah, you've got your purpose. Well, again, this goes back to the conversation earlier about people who think they know everything. I mean, I feel sorry for those people, you know? <laughs> I, can you imagine? I mean, and a lot of these people are, you know, 22 years old and, they, and they've, they've developed strong positions on the world's most complicated issues. What I don't understand is how quiet they are. They'll, they'll like, they won't tell you they don't know. Yeah. Okay. But they'll go back and research it on the internet. Yeah. And, and I go, but I keep telling these young kids, it's like Warren Buffett's like, you want to be curious like a 10 year old, yeah. you know, when he, yeah. somebody told me when he bought Shaw Industries up there, he walked the plant going, how does that machine work? How do you do that? How do yeah. you do that? Yeah. And he asked all these questions. I think young people are missing. Them. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think, I think you're right. Do you ask that. a lot of questions when I, you go into a customer? I do. I do. And, um, and you don't yeah, feel I, stupid I, no, for asking the questions, right? I, I don't, you know, look, I think that's the, I think that's the point is yeah. there's no way you can know everything about everything. Right. And I just, I just wonder, you know, these people that you see online who, you know, one week they're an expert on, you know, constitutional law. The next week they're an expert on, you know, vaccine distribution. Right. <laughs> it's like, you know, nothing about what you're talking about. Nothing. <laughs> I mean, unless you're an epidemiologist, you know, shut That's up. So true. But boy, they are, they, have, they, have convi they have conviction. Am I missing anything, Tom? Is there anything I didn't ask you that you won't tell him? Uh, anything in your heart, anything that you run into? I can't think of anything right off the top of my head, <laughs> but, but, but I'm willing to come back and drink bourbon and whiskey with you anytime. I can't tell you. First of all, how much I appreciate you taking interest in my kids. You got I appreciate that. I really do. Really great voice. And um, it's been a pleasure being here with Tom Green. And um, if you need some benefits for your company, he's the guy you need to call. So thank you all for, for joining, uh, joining in. And if you're ever out in Montana, you go get you some running iron <laughs> wheat straight whiskey. Thank you all for being here.